Okay, we finished up the, the study of angels. We're looking at fallen angels or demons. And we looked at, last week, we looked at the existence and nature of demons. And we saw that like angels, demons are spiritual beings. They are beings who are, you know, non-material, invisible beings. So they're, they're spiritual beings, but unlike angels, they are evil and unclean, meaning incompatible with God. So they're like angels. Uh, they're, in fact, they are fallen angels. They are spirit beings, but they are evil and unclean. And then we looked at the origin of demons, and clearly they were created by God through Christ. You can see that in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. And since all of, I gave you my thinking on this, since all of creation was pronounced very good in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, we can deduce that, ain't, that demons were originally created good and then turned against God. I mean, the alternative is to say, well, God called creation very good after he had created these good angels and they had rebelled against him and were evil. Uh, this doesn't seem right to me. So uh, it, it, you have you, you deduce from the fact they're created by God. God didn't create them that way. They rebel against God. And so we have that. You can deduce then that they rebel against He creates them, uh, you know, good because he pronounces everything very good. And then they rebel. And that happens. Now, when that rebellion occurs, it looks like it happens between Genesis 131, where God pronounces everything very good. And Genesis 3, 1 to 5, where you see that Satan tempts Eve through the serpent. So somewhere in there, it looks to me like that's where the fall occurred. Now, there have been people that speculate perhaps it was when angels, it became clear to them that they were to serve mankind. Uh, but we're not told that, you see. I mean, you can, you, that would make sense and all that, but we're just not told that. Now, I suggested to you that the fact angels rebelled against God doesn't mean that we'll face that possibility after we die. That's a question people have and say, well, if a rebellion was possible there, will we face it? I don't think that's right. In fact, I'm confident that's not right. God will grant us a perception of his being that will complete our transformation into the likeness of Christ. So God, by his grace, will do that. You see, and so I think that's, that's you know, when he, when he appears, we'll be like him. And I went through the thing about the intermediate state where you have the chasm that separates us. We can't go from one side to the other. So we'll no longer yield to sin as Christ does not sin. So that's how I see it. I don't see us fretting in, in the afterlife about, well, am I going to fall and that kind of thing. I don't think that's going to happen. And when we ended, I was explaining that demons, that they, which include Satan, they're mere creatures. Okay, we have to see that. They're mere creatures. They're in no way equal to God. And I want to pick back up there, say a little bit more about that, and then we'll go on. But demons, they are creatures the, the Bible knows nothing of dualism, this idea that you have two equally powerful forces, one good and one evil, vying for control of the world. You know, we have the dark force and the light force, and they're battling it out. See, the Bible knows nothing of that. You have demons are creatures. They, were, they are creatures God has, has made. They are fallen angels. They're, they're in rebellion. But they're not comparable to God. They're in rebellion, but God sets the limits of that rebellion. They're not free to do whatever they choose. And you can see that, for example, I mentioned last week in Job chapter, chapters 1 and 2, Satan couldn't harm Job or any of his possessions without God's permission to do so. You see, you, you so, so it's not like he's autonomous in this kind of thing. She, if you can hear it, she said, I, I wonder if God gave them a choice. Yeah, I, I think that's right. In a comparable to... He created them with free will, and they had to choose whether to seek fulfillment in themselves or in God. And at some point, some of them chose to seek fulfillment in themselves rather than God. And then they became, the way I see it, hardened and intensified in that rebellion so that they now are the evil, per perverse, horrible, uh, anti-God being. So, yes, I think there was, there was a, a choice that God gave them. And as I said last week... That's a function of creating them with free will, is that you can't create something with free will and, have, and not have free will. That's a logical impossibility. So in creating with free will, God necessarily had the potential that they would, some would choose to rebel against him. And it looks like that's what happened. Some did. And you just say, why would they do that? And then will we do that? And that's why I went through all that stuff about the beatific vision and those kinds of things, because... That's how I understand it, that we, we won't have to worry about that. But, yes, they did. They had a choice, and some of them chose 
to follow their own whatever. And that's where some people speculate, well, maybe they did that when it was clear that they were to serve mankind. And that was an insult to some. But, you know, we're not told that. You know, you just have we're not told what happened there and why they did that. But you also see in, in this idea of you know, demons not being free to do what they want. You see in Luke twenty two thirty one, you see that Satan asked for God's permission to attack the apostles. You see, to sift you as wheat. You see, that was uh, you was plural there. So to sift you as wheat, this is this idea he's seeking permission or demanding position, uh, permission. Some of them translated, but he's asking this permission. So you see that they're not free. They're in rebellion, but God sets the limits of that rebellion. And we're sometimes allowed to see how God incorporates the rebellion of demons into his larger plan. This all gets wild, you see. Because God, they're in rebellion, God sets the limits of that rebellion. Sometimes we're allowed to see, well, how is God incorporating their rebellion into his larger plan? And the greatest example, in my opinion, is the case of Satan's involvement in the crucifixion of Jesus. You see, I mean, God's plan involved the crucifixion of Jesus. You can see that in Acts 2.23, 3.18, Revelation 13.8, and of course that's all you know, basic New Testament theology is that God's plan involved the crucifixion of Jesus, yet Satan influenced Judas to betray Jesus to be crucified. You're going, what's going on with that? Well, I think God outwitted Satan. That's how I look at that. I say God outwitted Satan. That Satan didn't really understand what was going, and he thought if I attack and have this, this person killed, that will be my triumph. And it turns out, wrong. <laughs> You see, wrong. Now, if I'm right in that, you see, if that's correct, then Satan isn't directly behind Peter's attempt to dissuade Jesus from the cross in Matthew 16, 23. In my view, then, when Jesus says, you know, get behind me, Satan, he says that because Peter was talking in a way that was opposed to God's plan. When Peter's trying to dissuade Jesus from the crucifixion, he's talking as an adversary. Because the true plan is he's going to be crucified. So when trying to dissuade him from that, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You're acting as an adversary. I don't believe that Satan himself is doing that because my view is Satan was outwitted. Because he clearly went and influenced Judas to have Jesus crucified. And, you know, at the end, what happened? Well, that was his, that was God's plan. <laughs> that was God's plan. So they, sometimes you get to see it. You remember in 2 Corinthians, Paul's thorn in the flesh, which he specifically calls a tormenting messenger of Satan. You see that? Well, there we're, we're allowed to see. That's another example. Paul says it was given to him to keep him from being conceited because of the great revelations that God had given to him. So here we see this. It's clearly a messenger of Satan. And yet God incorporates it as what? As to keep Paul humble, to keep him from becoming conceited. Because of the great revelation. So there you see an example where he's attacked. Uh, of course, the, Satan in doing it is trying to harm Paul in some way. God allows it, and then he incorporates that into his purposes. So you say, well, how can God do that? Well, that's, how can God do a lot of things? You know, how can he speak a universe into existence? He's God. And so, you know, he's just beating Satan like a drum, as we would say. You know, playing him like that. All right, now, there are other examples of God likewise being able to bring uh, good results out of, out of evil intentions, out of the evil intentions of people. Right? We see examples of that. You say, well, how does that work? Well, you know, for example, the classic text, Genesis 50, verse 20, where Joseph said about his brothers having sold him into slavery. That was not something God, uh, you know, in line with God's will at one level, Right? It's, you grab your brother and throw him and sell him into slavery? But what does Joseph say? Joseph says, he says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So you see how God in his vision can allow this. He incorporates that into what he was doing. There was a larger picture, and he then used their evil and converted it to save many lives. You say, well, that would, that would require an absolutely incredible foresight and knowledge and understanding. Ah, yeah, that sounds like God. You see, that sounds like God. So, but there are a lot of times, you see, as I said at the end of last week, you and I can't see that. We can't see what is God doing. Well, a lot of times, just you can't see it. Sorry. 
Now, people tell you they'll tell all kinds of things, but there's just a lot of times he's too complex and deep and doing something that you and I. So sometimes we just have to hold on. You see, as I've told you before, I've told everybody, a friend of mine whose wife died of breast cancer, very aggressive form. He had two children. The next day, his mother died unexpectedly. Uh, and he told me his line to me was, sometimes reason doesn't reach far enough. And I always appreciated that because it was just like, I can't figure out what's going on and why this is happening, but I'm just going to hold on to God. Uh, and he has. Okay, now, now since demons are subordinate to God, uh, we naturally find in Scripture that they're subordinate to Jesus, right? I mean, demons are subordinate to Christ. We see that's evident in his exorcisms. Mark one twenty seven. it says he even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. So they're subordinate to Christ. In one case, the demons beg Jesus for permission to enter the pigs rather than the abyss. They're begging him because they understand who he is. They are creatures. He is God. So if he wants them to go somewhere, they're gone. If he tells them this, they're gone. You see, so this idea that it, we're, it, there's nothing about dualism. These equal powers, good and bad, vying for control of the of the universe or the earth they are creatures and you see of course other places mark uh, matthew 4 10 he told satan be gone and he left ephesians 1 21 colossians 2 10 specified that christ is supreme over every ruler and authority power and dominion every name that is named and you can see in ephesians 6 12 that these include the demonic luke chapter Chapter 10, verse 17, those sent out by Jesus, they report that the demons are subject to them in his name. Okay, so that shouldn't surprise us because they are subordinate to God. Jesus is God, the Son, and so they are subordinate to him. And you see that everywhere. All right, then the number and organization of demons, we're not told how many demons there are. We're not told how many there are. Now, some claim, and look at Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. In chapter 12, verse 9, that they say that that indicates that a third of the angels became demons. But that's really questionable. I mean, I think it's a questionable interpretation of those verses. The stars that are flung down by the dragon, it could simply be a symbol of a picture of his great power. I mean, I, I, it's just, you know, to take the idea of some kind of numerical thing that these represent one third of angels that are joining in a rebellion. Indeed, in, in chapter 12, verse 4, you have the dragon still in heaven when you have this being thrown down. And in chapter, in chapter 12, verse 9 of Revelation, both he and the angels are then thrown down. So I'm not sold on that, that, that you can know that there's a third. But that's a popular thing, and you'll hear that often. I'm just not convinced that uh, there's enough info to, to rest, you know, to make that case, that there's a third of them. Now, we do have clues that there are a significant number of demons. You know, there are, there are how many we don't know, but it looks like there's a significant number of demons. The Gerasene demoniac was possessed by so many demons that his name was Legion. And that's a term for a Ro Roman military unit of 6,000. I don't know if he had to be being literal about that, but you get the idea that, hey, there's a bunch when he says my name is Legion. But nowhere is the number of demons described in a manner that's comparable to the number of angels. You say, when you talk about angels, Hebrews 12, 22, they're innumerable. Revelation 5, verse 11, myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. So you don't get a description that gives you a, an indication that they are comparable in number, but we're simply not told it looks like there's a good number. But how many? Uh, you know, that's another thing that God has said, hey, don't worry about it. <laughs> you see, don't worry about it. Now, as with angel, there, there appears to be some kind of rank or order with demons. You know, we looked at, you know, you had the archangel and you have a number of indications with regard to angels that there's some kind of ordering, some kind of, a, you know, chains of authority or, or a position. Now, some organization, it seems implicit in the reference to demons as rulers slash principalities and as authorities slash powers. You get those references in Ephesians 1.21 and 6.12. So there seems implicit in that rulers and authorities and principalities and powers. You get in some kind of political uh, analogy applied to them. And Satan is the prince or the ruler of demons. So clearly we have some kind of elevation there. He's called the prince 
or the ruler of demons. You can see that in a number of places, Matthew 12, 24, Mark 3, 22, Luke 11, 15. And he's called the, the ruler of the kingdom of the air. And that's kind of an odd thing, but I'll say something about that in a second. The kingdom of the air in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. And demons are called his angels. In Matthew 25, verse 41, Revelation 12, verses 7 and 9. So it seems like, just like with angels, there's some order, there's some rank among these fallen angels, among these, these demons. Now, let me give you a little bit of just miscellaneous information about Satan. You probably have heard all of this, but uh, since I'm on it, I'm going to share it with you. Uh, the name Satan, the Hebrew name Satan, this comes from a verb that means adversary. Okay, so Satan is a Hebrew name. And it means, comes from that verb meaning adversary. Now, the Greek word Satan is simply a transliteration of the Hebrew name. So Hebrew name Satan comes from a word that means adversary. And then the Greek Satan is simply you take the Hebrew and you transliterate it over into Greek. Now, the most common Greek word for Satan is the devil. Diabolos. That's the most common Greek name for him. Which may have come from a verb meaning, you know, the origin of these things is just hard to be sure about. But it may have come from a verb meaning to separate. Now, if that's true, then we have an indication here that perhaps his name is rooted in the idea of one who separates people from God. Okay, so you have this devil is the most is the most common name, Diabolos. Now, so it, it could imply that that he's somebody who separates humans from God. There are a number of other terms are used for Satan. Or the devil. He's called the accuser, the tempter, Beelzebul, the evil one, Belial, the enemy or adversary, the deceiver, the great dragon, the father of lies. He's called a murderer and he's called destroyer. And none of those are pleasant, you see. Right, these, are, these are all negative, ugly things. Hostile. No friend, no sweetie, no kindness, all hostile. Okay, and you see that now. The NIV, they at one point, if you have an NIV, they for Beelzebul, they translated or, or transliterated really Beelzebub, and they quit that after in the TNIV, the next edition of the NIV, because you know most people were against that. They thought that wasn't the right way to do that. That's the more common and more accurate transliteration is Beelzebul, so they caught on. And you say, okay, well, what's Beelzebul? The majority of scholars think Beelzebul, it means Lord of the dwelling. Dwelling being refers to either the house of demons or to the house of a pagan god. So that's an odd term, you know, Beelzebul, but that's probably what that means. Now, John refers to Satan as the prince of this world. You see that in a number of places, John 12, 31, 14, 30, 16, 11. And he says in 1 John 5, 19, that the whole world lies in his power. And we think about that sometimes. Does that mean that he's ousted God? No, world in that sense. He's talking about uh, those opposed to God. You see, worldly, world in that sense. World is those organized in opposition to God. So that's this notion that he, he is the... You know, the whole world lies in his power and that those opposed to God are under Satan's control or influence, which is why he's called the God of this age. You see, this this age that carries on despite the arrival of the kingdom, this overlap of ages, he's called the God of this age. You see, he, he is the one at work, as I'll say in a minute, of those who are in opposition or battling against God. That's why he, he, he's blind. It says in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, he has blinded the minds of unbelievers. He's blinded the minds of unbelievers. And it says in 2 Timothy 2, 25 and 26, that he's trapped others in a web of false doctrine. And you think about, well, how does he pull this off? You see, that's what I was getting to last week. How does he translate his desires, this spirit being, so that they are manifested in this material world? But he does. You see, and we see that they're they're trapped. So the Jewish opponents of the church, because, you know, this thing about him working through false doctrine, we see the Jewish opponents of the church. They're called a synagogue of Satan in in Revelation chapter 2, 9 and 3, 9. Now, in fact, we heard somebody who was some popular television guy was appalled that somebody had spoken of, I don't know if he used the term synagogue of Satan, and he said, where would he, where would he ever get an idea like that? And I think, well, <laughs> I know where he'd get it. He read the Bible. 
That's where he got it. Now, prior to the crucifixion and resurrection, it looks like Satan had some kind of access to heaven and he continually accused the saints of disobedience. You see that in Job, in Job chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. You also see it in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1. Some idea of Satan being there, access to God, and accusing people. And so we see that certainly before the crucifixion and resurrection. Perhaps he was tolerated in that role before the crucifixion and resurrection because God acknowledged and recognized the correctness of those accusations. You see, that, that it's something that... There's justice there that these people do deserve something because they're in rebellion. Look at them. They're sinful. Look at them. And so perhaps, you know, God tolerated that because of that. Now, with the atoning death of Christ, God's justice has been satisfied. So Satan's accusations, they're no longer valid. And I think that's what's behind the expulsion from heaven that you read in Revelation chapter 12, verses 9 and 10, that with that victory, that those accusations are no longer tolerated. And that's how I understand that section of Revelation is that he is thrown down in that sense that he no longer has that accusing access because his stuff, God, God's justice has been vindicated in the death of Christ. So now out and he's thrown down. But that would require us to go and take a longer look at Revelation. Aren't you glad I'm not doing that? OK, now the Bible, it never ascribes a particular appearance to Satan. Despite, you know, how we see him, I mean, he's always done his sparky at ASU. But, but the Bible never ascribes a particular appearance to him. But from Paul's comments in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4, we know that he has the ability to masquerade as an angel of light. So he can, he can masquerade that way and appear he's deceptive. He can appear to be a, a good angel. So that's something kind of, you know, you say, whoa. That's something to be aware of. Now, the popular portrayal of Satan as having red skin and horns and a pitchfork, it's probably, it could be influenced by the, by the, the, the picture in Revelation chapter 12, where you have the horned dragon. But it's probably influenced also by cultural perceptions of grotesqueness. You see, with horns, you have kind of a hybrid human-animal kind of thing. And, and, you know, red, maybe that comes from the idea of his being murderous. Pitchfork was the idea that what he used to torment people. But these are just cultural pictures of this enemy, this evil one. Now, Satan doesn't live in hell, despite what Gary Larson thinks when he does all those cartoons where he's always down there with the flames and all. He doesn't live in hell. You see, pictured as this fiery place in the middle of the earth, hell is the final judgment place of the damned. You see, that's, it's, it's the final judgment place of the damned. It's not an intermediate state. And Scripture makes clear that Satan is active on earth. You see, where did he lock up somewhere there in the, in the middle of the earth? You see, but he's active. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it warns our enemy, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And his presence in our world is also evident from his description as the ruler of the domain of the air. In Ephesians 2.12. And from the fact his minions are said to be in the heavenly realms. In Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. Now the heavenly realms there, that probably I'd say no doubt refers to the first heaven. The atmosphere, if you remember in 2 Corinthians, Paul refers to the third heaven. You have the first heaven, the atmosphere. The second heaven would be interstellar space. The third heaven would be the true heaven, the abode of God. When he talks about here, when he talks about these spirits being in heavenly realms, he's talking about the atmosphere. And they're connected to that because they're spiritual creatures and they are thus perceived as air-like. But you see how that brings them in contact with us. They're You know, all around, that's how they're described. So when he talks about them as in heavenly realms and calls Satan the ruler of the domain of the air, that's the idea, you see, that they they are active here, active among us. And that's something to, to know and just be aware of. As I said, though, the first week when I talked about this, you can make two mistakes about it. You can dwell on demons and give them too much attention. And people do that. And that's not healthy. Or you can just ignore them and pretend that they're not real and that kind of thing. And that's not right either. So what I want to do is just bring it up, talk about it, because you had some questions, say about it, but we won't dwell on it and make this the focus of our spiritual lives. 
Okay? Because that, as I say, that's not a healthy thing. Now, activities of Satan and demons. As the name indicates, Satan is the adversary. He's opposed to all that God wants. He's the adversary. He's opposed to all that God wants, all that God wills, which means, among other things, he's opposed to what? People living righteously. He's opposed to people accepting the gospel. He's opposed to people remaining faithful to Christ. This is what he's after. He doesn't want you to live in a way that glorifies God. He doesn't want you to accept the gospel of Christ. He wants you, if you have accepted it, to reject it. And this drives him, and this is how he's motivated. He tempts people to sin. In fact, he's called the tempter. Matthew chapter 4, verse 3, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5. However God wants you to be and to act, Satan wants the opposite. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, Paul refers to him as the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. You see, you say, well, how's he doing? He's doing it. He's plotting. He's working. He's influencing. He's tempting. He's pulling. And if you're not tuned into that, if you don't see the battle, you're a mark. You're a sitting duck. And that's why I think some awareness of this uh, is, is spiritually useful. So he, he's opposed to how God wants you to act. See, we're not told how he goes about it. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5, dealing with a spouse not meeting his or her sexual obligations. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, dealing with reconciling with a penitent offender. It shows you that we can do some things that make us more vulnerable to his temptation. In other words, we can make ourselves more vulnerable to Satan's temptation. As Paul says in Ephesians 4.27, we're not to give the devil an opportunity or a foothold. So we have some duty here of wisdom that we need to conduct ourselves in a way that reduces our exposure and our vulnerability to his tempting efforts. And that requires, you know, you can just think of things. You can think of a young guy and a young girl who are dating. Right away, I can tell you some situations they need to stay out of. Why? Because you, you oh, no, 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 I'm, you know, I'm, and look, you got no idea what you're dealing with. You see, you have no idea of the power of what you're dealing with. So you can think of other things, other situations and circumstances, but you can see from Scripture clearly there are things that we can do that make us more vulnerable to temptation. And so we have to be aware of that. Now, Satan works hard to keep people from accepting the gospel of Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, he says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they do not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. He's blinded the minds of unbelievers so they do not see the gospel and the light of the glory of Christ. So, in other words, he's involved in shaping people's assumptions and perceptions. He is involved in socializing them into this worldly age. You say, well, what is that talking about? Well, you go ahead and talk to some people about spiritual things. There are some people who've been so sucked into Western mentality and naturalism and all this stuff. You talk to them about spiritual reality and they look at you like you're crazy. They just know intuitively that all that is is matter and energy and law operating over time. That we came from nowhere out of nothing by chance. And they're just certain of it. So certain of it that if you talk to them about God or spiritual realities, they're just bouncing off them. They're just completely. Well, how did they get that way? Well, they got that way because, you know, we've advanced and we've learned and we're out of the sticks and, the, you know, back from the, the old nutty old people. Really? You think that? So here we have mankind all this time had this perception. And just at the end here, now we've arrived. Oh, they were all stupid. They were all morons. You remember like the Princess Bride, that guy who sits here, Aristotle, Socrates, morons. Well, that's how we think. All of these great, well, no, no, they were, just, they were just, you know, they didn't have our enlightened sense. Okay, I got another idea for you. Okay, this is the fruit of the enemy working. He has socialized people. Into this, And that's what I think he's talking about. See, when he says he's blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they do not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. It just seems stupid to them. It seems impossible. It seems backward. It's, well, that's, all of that came from that, you see. 
You see that? It sounds foolish or offensive. In 1 Corinthians 1.18, you see that idea that sounds foolish. You know, they had their ways, too. The idea of a crucified God. Oh, come now. God crucified? That's crazy. All right, this is how he snatches uh, you know, from some the word that's sown in their heart. That's how I picture that. He snatches from some the word so they cannot believe and be saved. You see, in Luke 8.12, Acts 13, verses 6 to 10, the, the prophet Elymas tried to dissuade Sergius Paulus from what? Receiving the gospel. What does Paul call him? He's a child of the devil. He's trying to persuade. Paul is trying to bring this person into the light. This guy's trying to pull the other way. And he says, you're a child of the devil. Now, why is he saying that? Because that's how the devil is. The devil is trying to keep people socialized into this thing that says the gospel is not true. The resurrection is false. Jesus is a myth. All of that stuff. Now, you talk to people and say, you're saying that I'm inspired by Satan. Well, you know, maybe I won't say that right to you directly, but yes! You see? Now, I don't, do I think you know it, that you're sitting around in seances? No, it's deeper than that. He's much more clever than that. He knows that if he just, you know, popped in and said, here, here I am. Serve me. Well, most people would flip out. So he just sits here and says, I got a better way for you. Here, you go to school and have everybody tell you you're a genius. And you go there and, well, these people don't know anything. You know, look at this guy. He's on a porch swing. What does he know? All right. I'm telling you, this is how this stuff works. Okay, now one of Satan's tools in, in this regard is the promotion of false religious beliefs. He uses that. See, the false gods that Israel served, there were in reality demonic forces. You can see that in Deuteronomy 32, 16 and 17, Psalm 106, 35 to 37. And Paul says that the false religions of the first century Mediterranean world, he says that what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons, not to God. 1 Corinthians 10.20. So who's behind these false... If you go to them and say, you know, that your religion's demonic. Well, they wouldn't say that. they say, no, we're, we're... Okay, I understand what you think, but who's behind it? Who has pulled you off and created this false alternative that allows you to feel some kind of satisfaction and fulfillment of the religious impulse with which God created you? You have to see he's, you know, this guy is multi-talented. He, he doesn't just sit here and go on one track. He will pull some with religion. He will pull some with absolute, you know, absolutely just running headlong into sin. He has all kinds of ways. And if you're not into the Bible and into the Word and tuned in spiritually, he'll beat you to death. You have to have spiritual glasses to see the war. To see him where he's working and pulling and acting. If you just go, oh no, okay, well you're going to get it. You you have to see there is a war going on. That sounds kind of freaky. It's the Bible! There's a war going on. And that's what he's talking about. That's what we're seeing here when you look at with, uh, with, with demons. Okay, so I'm convinced that Satan is significantly involved in the non- Christian religions of today. But he also works to create false versions of Christianity. Right, Paul says of the opponents in Corinth, what, they're masquerading as apostles of Christ. Well, what were they? They were talking Jesus. They were singing Jesus. But what had they done? They created a false version of Christianity, and who was motivating that? He says they're masquerading as apostles of Christ. And then he adds, and no wonder for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It's not surprising then if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. So he, he identifies them. He says they are servants of Satan who are masquerading as Christians and who are creating a false Christianity and they're pulling you to it. And Paul is laboring with all that is in him when he writes 2 Corinthians to tell them this is bogus. You've got to stick with me. I am the ambassador. I am an apostle. I'm telling you the truth. They're not. Okay, but you see how what a war it was, what a struggle. Because he's vying for them, for their lives and their souls and that kind of thing. All right, false doctrine is a grave matter, which is why Satan employs it. We tend to think, well, you know, doctrine, who cares about doctrine? Ah, you know, that's it. It's a grave matter. You can see it all over the Bible. That's why he would use it. 
Because it's serious and has consequences. Does that mean every question in the Bible is crucial? Every qu- No, 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 no. <laughs> okay? But it also means there are things that are important, right? That can be twisted. There are things that are important. You see? I mean, that's the history. Heretics are always around. These heresies don't die because the enemy finds them useful. He can feed people with them. You see, he can stoke them and say, okay, wow, look, here are all these boneheads for thousands of years. They never understood this, but you, you've understood it. Oh. You see? All right, well, that's, that's, he works that way. All right. Satan works hard to cause those who've accepted the gospel to abandon Christ, not only because God is glorified in their salvation, but because the abandonment of Jesus demeans his gift. You know, you've crucified the Son of God all over again. You're treating His gift as though it's garbage. So that's like a twofer for Him. You see, he, get, he gets you pulled away, and He also has you demeaning the glory of the gift that God had given you. Ooh. So He works hard. He works hard at doing this. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 13, Paul tells the saints what? To put on the full armor of God so that they may stand against the schemes of the devil. He's talking to Christians. He tells them, you put on the full armor of God so that you may stand against the schemes of the devil. He's a plotter. He's a schemer. And so they needed the full armor of God to do it. First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5, he says that he feared that the tempter might have tempted them so that their efforts might have been useless. He's concerned that they may have been lured away by the tempter. Satan's not only assaulting the church with false doctrines and the lure of sin, but in First Thessalonians 2.18 we read that he thwarted Paul's return to the church in Thessalonica, no doubt attempting to deprive that young church of the encouragement that Paul's visit would bring to them. Well, he said that he was thwarted, he thwarted that visit. How did he do that? Well, look, that's what I'm back to this point. How does he express his will in this material world? But he does. And so there was an example of that. He, 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 Satan is at work in division in the church. That discourages people. It deflates people. It bums them out. <laughs> right? Right? They don't have a sense of we are God's people and he's doing something with us. We have a, we have a sense of we got a group of two here and they're sitting there going, yeah, 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 you got a people, I got, you know, two over here. Yeah! Instead of a group of people who've been redeemed that God is doing something with. Okay, he's at work in that. He's doing that because it discourages people and it deflates them. And it makes them easier targets for other things. Satan is at work in the persecution of the church, which frightens people. When the church is attacked and assaulted, it's okay, you know, when it's like a breezy kind of thing. But when people are really jumped on, when people lose jobs and some lose their lives, that makes Christianity a whole different thing, doesn't it? Put yourself in that circumstance. That we are a group of people who are persecuted to the point of suffering and death. How many people would be here? You see? It's a different thing. It's a different thing. And so, what is he doing? He's involved in that. Because what does it do? It frightens people. It discourages people. And he's after that. Now, demons can take possession of people. There's no question about it. You see demon possession all through Scripture. Uh, New Testament especially, he says, compared to the rest of the Bible and to modern Western society, demons took possession of people during the New Testament time during Christ's ministry with astonishing frequency. Okay, you have this demon possession really just stuffed in Christ's ministry and in the first, the first century. Compared to the rest of the Bible, compared to Western society, we look around and we don't see it. Well, why is that? If demons are real and demons possess people, why is it that you see this all over the place in the New Testament? You don't really see it in Western society and you don't see it that much in the rest of the Bible. Let me give you some thoughts on that from a guy, uh, Dwayne Garrett, from his book, uh, Angels and the New Spirituality. I've always liked this. He says, first, demon activity may have been more common when Jesus was on earth because of the spiritual conflict surrounding the incarnation. In other words, it may be that having God... In the flesh, walking the earth, simply roiled the underworld. 
Okay, how could that happen? Well, that makes sense to me. Okay, so that may be one part of it. He continues, he says, second, perhaps demon possession is still common, but we do not recognize it as easily as Jesus did. Right, what would we do? We would, come on, man. Demon possession? We would write off any indication of demon possession. We would take it as some form of mental illness. Absolutely. Okay, so maybe there's some, maybe we're numb to it. Then third, he says, Jesus happened to come during a time that was politically, socially, and religiously unstable when people embraced strange new types of spirituality. Thus, demon possession was more common. On the third view, demonic activity waxes and wanes in different times and different places in proportion to the behavior of that society. And then he says, I think there's truth to all three of these. But do you see what I'm saying? Like in Africa... Right? What happens? You have an awful lot of, you know, demons are much more open to that, and you see that. Okay, now we would say we see that because they're just stupid people. Okay? You know, they're, they're just ignorant, and that's how they are. But maybe it is because they're in a society of animism and these other things that are more open to that, that demons work more there. Whereas here, the way to bag Americans, how do you get Americans? You convince them that there is no such thing as spiritual reality. You just make them believe that we came from nowhere out of nothing by chance and that all that is is matter and energy over time. So don't, don't give them any clue that there's a spiritual reality. We'll bag them that way. Okay? But we have other ways of bagging others. So I can see how that you would have a difference so it doesn't startle me or anything. I mean, there's a, there's a rational way to understand the difference in the rest of the Bible and in Western culture from what you see in the, in the New Testament. I have just a little bit more to say. Maybe I'll say that and we'll carry on next week. Heard that bell. Thanks.